What if you found out your favorite fiction author was actually pulling all those incredible stories from her real life? Well, on the next Grown-Ass Woman's Guide, you'll meet author Jane Rosen, who is doing just that. We talk about her latest book, the very unexpected way she became an author, and the crazy twists and turns that only real life can provide. Plus, she has tips for those of you who are thinking about writing a book. Check it out. How often do you read for pleasure? Daily? Occasionally? Or are you like me and you enjoy it so much, but it rarely moves to the top of the priority list? Today's episode may change that. For me, I often consume nonfiction as an audiobook. I don't know what it is, but I just feel like I'm able to receive the information better if I'm cleaning or driving or doing some other activity. It's kind of like podcasts. And I get a new credit each month with my Audible subscription. In fact, let's hold up for a second. If you are listening right now and you would love to dive into a great audiobook like the one written by my guest today or any other title, I would love to send you one of my Audible credits for free. But this is what I need you to do. Head to your favorite podcast app and leave an honest rating and review. Take a screenshot of the review, email me at hello at grownasswoman.guide, and I will send the first five people to do that, the audiobook of your choice. That easy. All right, so where was I? When it comes to fiction, there's nothing like curling up with a good book. I'm able to shut off my very active brain, push everything else aside for a little while, and enjoy a great story. Recently, I did that for an entire weekend, it's a true story, with the latest book from today's guest. On Fire Island by Jane Rosen was the perfect end of summer weekend read for me. What I love about Jane's writing is that it comes from her own experience as a wife, mom, sister, daughter, and friend. Her stories, while fiction are inspired by her own life, sometimes to the displeasure of others. You'll have to hear that story. And Jane shares what I think is a major twist her own career took when she decided to put pen to paper for her first of five novels. Yes, we talk about her book, which you can find linked in the show notes, but mostly we talk about the themes in the book and how we as grown-ass women can learn and grow by having the courage to open ourselves up to new ideas. Oh, And if writing a book has been on your bucket list, definitely stay to the end. Jane gives some great, no-nonsense advice on how to get started. Let's dive in. Jane, welcome to the Grown-Ass Woman's Guide. Thank you for having me. I loved your book. Fiction for me is me time. I will listen to nonfiction on Audible or... Recently rediscovered the library. Like, what a concept. But fiction for me is like open that book, lie in my bed or on a hammock or whatever, and just enjoy the journey. So, thank you for giving me that because it was really, really good and I really loved it. Thank you so much, Jackie. I loved writing it. (laughs) It's my favorite of all my novels. It is? Yeah. And I just, have loved sharing it with the world this summer. It's been great, great experience. Yeah. I always know it's a good book when at the end of it, I'm I'm a little sad. Like I'm a little sad that I'm done hanging out with these characters. You know, I've become fond of. Um, that's when I know it was, I like really liked it. <laughs> it's a great feeling. Like I have to read so many books for research. And then I have to read a lot of books when people ask me to blurb their books. Right. So when I get to choose a title of my own that I just sit down and read for no other reason than pleasure. It's the best feeling. Yeah, it's awesome. So your book's called On Fire Island. I will tell you right now, every time I think of Fire Island, like I always think of like these really hot gay guys (laughs) going to their weekend on Fire Island. I never thought of it as this place that families go. and, and, And of course, it's like, you know, but when was your first experience there? Because I know you live part of the year there. And then when did you think, I have to write about this place? Okay, so there are 17 different communities on Fire Island, and there's only two gay communities. And while they are amazing and deserve every bit of accolades that they get, there's all these other communities that are completely different. The reason everything is so different is because there are no cars. Mm. So you kind of just interact with 
the town on your left or the town on your right where you could ride your bicycle or walk there. Now, I go to the gay communities or to Fair Harbor, which is in the other direction, a fun town to visit, or Kismet, whatever it is, by water taxi. But it's not like an everyday thing. It would be an event. You know, let's all go down to the Pines or let's go to Gay Bingo, which is in my book. Mm -hmm. So we don't all melt that much. It's a storybook thing, those two towns. Gay well, it's like Cape Cod and Provincetown, yeah. right? It's like, that's only a small part of it. <laughs> you know? Right. It's a small part of it. And it's such a wonderful place for anyone to visit and yeah. feel so at home. So it's a great place. But my first visit on Fire Island was in a share house in Ocean Beach, which is another big town. And I had a share house there for a couple of summers, left. And then my roommate had a share house and I went with her. And my husband-to-be opened the front door of the share house. And I met him. We got He got arrested for drinking a Snapple in town the next day. On, you weren't allowed to drink anything, anything in a bottle in the town of Ocean Beach. It was called the Land of No. Warren got arrested <laughs> drinking the Snapple. I followed him into the police station. And I said to the officer, my boyfriend just got off the boat. And I was just explaining the rules to him when you arrested him. I think you should let him go. I mean, it wasn't like arrest, arrest. It was like a $50 fine, but still. And the, the man let him go. The police officer let him go. And that was it. <laughs> Warren was like, wow, you just got me out of trouble in two seconds. Marry me. <laughs> Marry me. I think like wait, two and a half weeks later, we were like but, talking marriage. Oh, so, really? Yeah. But wait, but hold on one second. Go back to this whole law. So is it because it was glass? Yeah. I'm not, I mean, this was a while ago and I think it was because of the glass and because of also drunken behavior. I mean, you could be holding a Snapple bottle, but maybe you really filled it with rum or whatever. Wow. It was a whole to do. You weren't allowed to eat or drink anything on the streets. Wow. I've got to interrupt here for a second because this is fascinating. I did a little search and lo and behold, today in 2023, these rules are still in effect. According to villageofoceanbeach.org, on the beach, you may only drink water out of a plastic bottle. You may consume non-alcoholic beverages in the commercial business district, but they must be in plastic or paper container, no glass or cans. And get this, eating is allowed only in the commercial business district. There is no eating permitted on the beach, overpasses leading to the beach, or in the residential area. I don't know why I had to look this up and share it, but I did. Have you ever heard of rules like this? Seriously. Okay, okay, back to Jane. The police officer who arrested us came to our 10-year anniversary party with two Snapple bottles with handcuffs around them. It was the cutest thing, (laughs) yes, as a gift. I I feel like that story right there probably sums up Fire Island for you right there. It was adorable. that, That the man who arrests him or finds him 10 years later is like at the anniversary party. Yes. Yes, it's a very small town, as you can see from the book. All the towns, I think, are very small towns on Fire Island. And we just never left. And a lot of people that meet out there romantically buy houses out there and stay. Mm. Because it's not the easiest place to be. You have to you drive to the ferry, which isn't terrible. It's about an hour from the city on a good mm-hmm. day. And then you schlep all your things. There's no cars. You have a little wagon tied up by the ferry and you load everything on and you go to your house and you have to buy most things in the little one little market and one little liquor store. Mm -hmm. And it's not the easiest place to get stuff. So you got to really be committed. (laughs) I think when you meet there and you have that romantic vision of it, it gives you a good reason to stay. The other reason to stay is really for the kids because the freedom, the dichotomy between New York City and Fire Island is Mm. unbelievable. By the time you read in the book, by the time they're like six years old, they're signing their name at the market, buying a sandwich, yeah. sitting with their friends, eating it. You don't see those kids for hours at a time. Yeah. It's and like going different. back to the Gen X childhood, right? Yes. <laughs> like really what we is. had that we couldn't give our kids necessarily in certain areas. It's like you actually had the opportunity to give that to your, to your daughter. Which is quite unbelievable. Yes, exactly. Come home when the lights, when the sun goes down kind of thing. Right. Oh, I love that. One of the things that really stuck with me, so it's not a spoiler, but your main character is 37 years old when she passes away of cancer. 
that's the concept here. But it really struck me at this point of my life. And I think a lot of women can relate to, we don't have to die to kind of get a bird's eye view of where we've been and what impact we've made. Is there a message to women through this character? Like, what were your thoughts when you created this character who's passed, but she's seeing the life that she left behind? Where did that come from? Well, my sister passed away when she was 39. Mm, I'm sorry. She was pretty strong about it, but she had two children that she was leaving behind. So I purposely did not give Julia children because I, I think that would have made it too difficult in many ways. I wanted to show this experience in life and I wanted to show a map of how to get through it without it being a nonfiction self-help kind of book. Hmm. because I've experienced so much death in my life and I've gotten through it with resilience and with humor. I just wanted to display that inside this wonderful community that I love, the supportive community of people. Yeah. And is there any sort of messaging in there? Like, or am I reading into it? Is there any sort of messaging in there with Julia as far as how you live today and, and how you look back on that life? I think the message really is that love doesn't die and that even if you lose someone, you can keep that love with them and that love for them for the rest of your life. Yeah. And I think that's my main message. If someone dies, it doesn't mean they're not still with you. It doesn't mean you can't talk to them. It doesn't mean you can't love them. It doesn't mean that your relationship is over. Yeah. Being able to watch the people that she left behind go through that, the depths of grief, but there are hints of hope. How does your personal life experience show up in, in this book, but in all of the books that you have written? Well, this book, it's really quite blurred, meaning that the, the sense of place in the book is so from my opinion, it's my fire islands that I'm showing you. Mm. So this summer, some people would say things to me like, you didn't talk about the tennis as much as you talked about the softball or whatever it was. <laughs> and I would say that's because this is my version. This is right. my fire island. So yes, it's all over the book. The people in the book are original thoughts, really. They're not, a few of them are strongly based on people, but most of them are just an amalgamation of everybody, you yeah. know, because it is a, it's a kooky place filled with kooky people. It certainly comes out in the pages of the book. I think all my books have some of myself in them. Mm -hmm. Like my last book, A Shoe Story, my dad had passed away when I was 11. And he mm, was in sorry. World War II okay, in the Coast Guard. And he was in the invasions of Sicily, Salerno, and Normandy. But of course, I was 11 when he died. It's not like people don't talk about the war anyway, but he certainly wasn't talking about it to me. But I explored his entire trip in A Shoe Story, like, through one of my characters, oh. I, I got letters that he wrote home to his mom, like the, what are they called? Not letters. Um, you know, when they send them. Oh, yeah. Tele uh, telegraph thank or you. Tele tele telegram. Tele <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yes. And I, I traced his ship number and where he went. And it was really oh. an incredible journey that I got to experience through the eyes of a 17 year old man, which is when my father signed up for the Coast Guard. It was really amazing. Wow. So what a to, gift. Yes, it was a gift. It sounds like a love letter to your dad. It was really interesting. Yeah. It really was. Even though the book's called a shoe story. <laughs> yes, I don't think it. Um, well, sometimes we gotta yeah. sell we gotta sell the book, you know. <laughs> yeah. My first novel, Nine Women One Dress, has an entire chapter with all family names of mine, like old family names like two generations ago. So that was fun too. There are definitely oh, ways cool. you explore your own life when you're writing a novel, even though it's fiction. Yeah. Have you ever ticked anybody off with portrayals or names or situations? Um, I have heard that I ticked someone off. <laughs> I'd rather not say it, <laughs> but yes, I have heard that I ticked someone off. And the funny thing is the person was right. Like someone said, this reminds me of my husband and to a friend of mine. And I was like, hmm, 
It is very much. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, and then sometimes I just get my own little sweet revenge and no one even knows about it except me. <laughs> right. <laughs> But, that's hilarious yeah it is kind of funny but mostly wow. it's all yeah. yeah don't that's cross so cool. me don't cross me Jackie. <laughs> i know don't get in the, <laughs> don't get in jane's way you'll be in the next book did you release five books in 10 years could you believe it it's not ten, i think it was 2016 i wrote my published my first novel and i have my fifth novel coming out in the spring wow yeah Oh, so wow. Not even like eight years. And, yeah. and and through like so much I'm sure has happened in your own life through those eight yeah. years. Like, how do you approach? So, you know, the woman listening is mostly women. Um, It's a grown ass woman, probably over 40, like mm-hmm. has been through some things. Like, how do you approach writing your books differently than when you first started writing? I think that when I first started writing, I was a screenwriter before this. I think when I first started writing, it felt more like a hobby. Mm. And while I love writing, I really do. I really enjoy it. It now feels more like a career. Most days I get up and write for a number of hours, just as if you were going into an office. Right. So I think I approach that differently. I also, I changed, I pivoted at like 50 years old from screenwriting to novel writing. So that was a big deal. It was a great next chapter for me. Mm. I I told you before we started recording that one of my children had been ill and that's how I started writing my first book because my daughter had something called POTS at the time, which caused her to faint. Mm. And she was at the high school performing arts and she would started to realize I'm going to faint, you know, and she'd make her way to the nurse's office and sit down and call me and I would come pick her up. But that stressed her out. She's a really good girl. And she hated the thought that I was of making this panic phone call and me running across town and downtown because it was kind of far from my apartment Mm -hmm. and picking her up. So we decided that I would start writing the novel I always wanted to write in the library across the street from her school. Oh, yeah. So you know, talk about making lemonade from lemons or whatever, you know, I sat across the street from her school and wrote and wrote and wrote. And when she needed me, I crossed the street and got her. And it was kind of unbelievable. And I wrote most of the books sitting in that library. Wow. Yes. Me and a host of homeless people. (laughs) That's amazing. (laughs) Was writing novels kind of part of the plan anyway, or did it shift because you were at that library? Like which came first? I was a screenwriter, as I said, and I was on a trip and I was at the airport and I met someone who said, I have a great story for you. And usually I'm, I'm really wary of that because whatever, sometimes yeah, it's like, because people never have a great like, story for you. <laughs> or you feel like you're stealing your st- I don't know. But she, she told me the story and the story was of a woman who worked at Bloomingdale's and was got a, a dress was returned covered in formaldehyde. That was the story she told me. And I was like, wow, this is a book. I'm going to trace that dress, which is like the end, right? The dress is covered in formaldehyde, back to the beginning. And that's how I wrote Nine Women, One Dress. But the reason I wrote it as a book had nothing to do with the library. It had to do with all the screenplays that I had written in my life were never made into movies. I sold Mm -hmm. them, but they weren't made. And I was tired of just sharing my story with my family and and a studio that bought it or whatever, you know, a producer or anything like that, but not with people. So I decided I would write nine women, one dress when I got the time to write it as a book. And then it would probably get made into a movie, which is funny because it was optioned very quickly. But yeah, so I I had it in my head that I was going to attempt to write a novel instead of a screenplay. Wow. And isn't that wild that you still, you know, optioned into a film like a screenplay. So you're still writing the screenplay sort of, um, but also getting it in front of all of those people that you weren't reaching, which is amazing. And it's a treat of a book, I must say, if I must say so myself. Yes. Well, I'm going to go back and read all of them now. I'm, I'm, (laughs) I'm in. If you've heard this podcast before today, you know, I am so passionate about having honest, open conversation with other women over 40. I love how we speak the same language of experience and grown assery, but I've been noticing something lately that I want to explore. 
and that is intergenerational relationships and mentorship. One of the things that keeps popping into my life lately is the benefits of having intergenerational friendships. You know, having yes. friendships who are women who are older and also the one thing I haven't valued enough is having friendships with those who are much younger, really taking their perspective and their life story into play and, and just, you know, building a relationship. And so in the book, you have this three generation friendship happening with these men, which is so enjoyable and so refreshing. When did you start to think about intergenerational friendship? And what are your thoughts, especially now that you've put it on paper? So Fire Island is a real generator of intergenerational friendships because yeah. you're always with the same people. Like you're sitting next to them at the ball game. You are on the ferry, riding the ferry or in the market with them. You see people and become friends with people of all different ages all the time. During COVID, which was really when I already had this written book, for the most part, whatever. During COVID, we started playing baseball, my husband and I. We stayed out in Fire Island for six months. We've always played baseball, but we started playing like four days a week with kids and moms and dads, anyone who was out there. And we really became friends with these kids. Like at this point, those COVID kids that I played ball with, they are my friends just as mm. much as their parents are. I'll sit and chat with them. I learned so much from them. Just as much as you could learn from an older person, yeah. you could learn from a younger person. My kids are my friends. The things they teach me now in this world, this woke world we're living in, nothing could be more important than being friends with a 16-year-old. Yeah. If you want to keep up with what's going on, you know, and not say the wrong thing, especially as a writer. Right. So. Oh, yeah. That's got to be important. Yeah. Because I mean, the language has changed. Everything has changed. And I, I have a lot of respect for the fact that you're listening, especially as a writer, because you have to, if you're going to be successful, you, you should probably listen to younger generations and know what they think and feel and all that good stuff. If we currently aren't on Fire Island, <laughs> and many of us don't necessarily have that life style where there is that mixture of all these different generations, do you have any tips for how someone can continue to learn from a younger generation? Yeah, I do. I think in both directions, you could do something very interesting. You could volunteer. In New York City, there's an organization called Dorote, mm -hmm. where, and I'm sure there are similar organizations everywhere, where you could visit an elderly person. And I started doing that with my kids years ago and ended up matched up with someone who I met with like once a week for a couple of years. So you could do that and it's, you, you would get, you get more out of it than they do almost because it's just really interesting and fulfilling and wonderful. Yeah. And then in the other direction, you could actually do the same thing. You could volunteer at anywhere, high school, any, anything that you wanted to do, but also community centers, you know, mm -hmm. the Y, the JCC, whatever it is. And if you have kids, well, there you go. A friend, their friends and, and them. You know, yeah. Cousins, nieces, so many people. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, my niece today, I sent her like a meme on Instagram <laughs> of some, you know, of two reptiles, but it's sounds silly, but it's, it's a connection. Yep. You know, and I made a joke and she wrote back. It's, it's, it's yeah. It's their language. I started working for my nephew a couple of years ago, just for a short time. And I couldn't get over the language in his company. I had no, I mean, between low hanging fruit and is that in your wheelhouse and all of these things, I was like, why aren't they speaking English? I, I had to Google half the things they said. <laughs> but that's amazing because you're doing it though. You're not rejecting it. You're, you're learning from it. You're Googling. I didn't want to feel like an, an old lady. Yeah. So I wasn't going to say, what are they talking about? I Googled it. Yeah. That's wild. Um, my middle son is in marching band and I volunteer as the media and publicity person. And so I do all their social media and I make reels and all that. And just being around those kids, you know, it's so cool. Like, I feel like teenagers get such a bad rap, right? They get this like, oh, they're moody and they're this and they're that. And like, they're probably all the things that people say. And they have so much insight, their own experiences. And it's just, it's fascinating to be around them. I really love it. 
And also I go to them and I go, is this lame? You know, right? <laughs> and, and they'll tell me. <laughs> and there's so many things, like I said before, that you can't say anymore. Like remember that George Carlin joke, the seven words you can't say on television. Oh, it's yeah. 7,000 words now. <laughs> he would have to have like a six hour special to say all the words. Right. Although I would listen to George Carlin for six hours. <laughs> he was so funny. But yeah, you're, you're right. And I think not rejecting that and just, just being open minded to that is is really important. So when I think of mentorship, I often think of myself as like being the mentor. And, and I never think of like, there are also women who have done incredible things who are in their 70s and 80s who they have a lot to say and a lot to share. Yes. And everyone wants the same thing right? Everyone wants love and friendship, and a good meal. I mean, everyone wants the same thing. They, you yeah. know, they want to laugh, they want to cry, they want whatever it is. Age really doesn't, it's a social construct, right? It doesn't really yeah. make a difference. Yeah. So I, I appreciate that. To connect with Jane, follow her on Instagram or visit janelrosen.com. And if you're feeling the itch to write your own book or start a creative project, Jane has some tips to get you started at any age. I hear often from women like, I have this book in me. I have this book in me. What advice would you give yourself at this stage of your life if you were going to now write your first book? I think I would take a class. Mm. And let me tell you why. Even if I knew how to write a book. Because taking a, like a 10-week class on fiction writing in a group workshop kind of situation, you're going to do the work. You're going to have deadlines, you're going to do the work. And, and you probably will not, obviously, you're not going to end up with a finished novel. But you will have started your novel and you would get past the point where you could say, oh, I, I could see myself finishing this. Like there's mm -hmm. a point when you're writing and you're writing and it's the beginning and you're like, oh, my goodness, look, there's so many blank pages ahead of me. But there's a point that you pass where you say, I got this. I'm halfway through. Yeah. So if you take a class just to spearhead it. It's a great way to start anything. I think it's a great way to start any new thing that you want to try. Mm. And it, it provides accountability built in. Yes. Yeah. yeah you, Do you have, have to have a certain amount of pages for next right. week. Right. Right. Do you have any, um, obviously they'd be virtual or whatever, but do you have any that you'd recommend? Sure. You could go on Zibby Books. Mm hmm. She has a lot of great classes. You could go on the Gotham Writers Workshop. Those are both online. Okay. And I do think if you can get yourself to a class in a local class in your neighborhood, because I don't really think they have to be so exceptional. Yeah. You're not I mean, a screenwriting class. I think you, you need more details on how to write a screenplay, but fiction just seems just not easier, but not needing to be taught as much. Do you know what I mean mm, by that? Like not as technical. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, if you could go in person, what a great thing to get yourself out once a week to do. But if you can't, the Zoom is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So Zippies and Gotham Writers. Thanks so much for listening. Be sure to come back next week for another new episode. We are about to declutter your life, my friend. I would love to hear from you. Please leave a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And let's connect on social. You can find me at grownasswoman.guide. And please tell a friend about the show. Until next time, you are a grown ass woman. Act accordingly. Spring has sprung. And with the change of seasons, sometimes comes an increase in vitality. If you're feeling in the mood for a little more personal time, may I suggest Coconut. Coconut is all about providing clean and natural ingredients when you're enjoying your most intimate moments with or without a partner. Naturally safe products developed by people who are obsessed with quality. Get 15% off with promo code GROWNASS at grownasswoman.guide forward slash coconut. That's 15% off with promo code GROWNASS at grownasswoman.guide forward slash coconut.